welcome to this evening's book launch. I'm Joanna Peters and I'm the MC for this evening. It's wonderful to be here, it's such a thrill, and also to see some familiar names coming in. Um, so I used to be editor of the Strad magazine quite a long time ago and I run a creativity podcast which I know at least a couple of people registered for tonight have been on. So I imagine you're just as pleased to be here to have something to go to. And who would have thought a year ago that an online book launch would be a, a thing? <laughs> um, but actually, we've really seen the upsides of it here from seeing where people have registered from. We know you've come from all corners of the globe or sections of it, which, of course, wouldn't have been able to happen before to get Jessica's friends and supporters really from all around the world. So we've got a wonderful hour ahead of us, um, about, about an hour. Jessica's going to read from the book. I'll be interviewing her about it, which I know is something that a lot of you really wanted when the idea of a launch was first floated. And we're going to have a Q&A so you can ask her questions, but please don't send them in yet or they'll get lost, but we'll, I'll, we'll be a chance for that later. We're also going to have some more music and some pictures. So people are still joining us. Um, so like all good parties, we'll just leave a few minutes before we kick off properly. But I'd be really curious to know who, who's already read Immortal? Um, I know it was only officially published last week, but it's been out for a while. I know I've had mine on my desk here for a little bit. Um, so perhaps put, put a yes in the chat box um, or, or a wave and we'll see who's got it. Oh, Eleanor has read it. Um, Thomas, yes, of course you have. <laughs> who's, who's got it and still waiting to read it? And who's, and there's probably a lot of you who haven't yet read it and you've really got a treat in store, actually. So I, yes, at the weekend, I ended up sending Jessica a message really quite late at night going, I know I should be asleep. I know I've got to go to bed, but I cannot put this down. And it's so emotional. <laughs> um, I did put it down and I did go to bed, but it's it's such a wonderful read, um, such as an immersion into Beethoven's time, but just so much, so much more than that. Um, just one other thing about tonight, a lot of you probably, oh, Hel Nina's read it, Helen is halfway through, it's great, yes, Claire's read it and loved it. Um, a real page turn says Claire, yes it is, absolutely, um, lots of us up at night. <laughs> Um, deep in the in the traumas of Beethoven and his circle. Um, the really interesting thing about this, which a lot of you probably know, is that it has moved 20 years ago. Publishing was just you signed up with a publisher and they published your book. And Jessica did that for I think the first four novels. Tasmanian is by your bedside. Excellent. This says love it. Um, just ordered it. Um, and actually, Jessica was one of the first people to really, really embrace a different model of crowdfunded publishing. And I think I'm probably right in saying, Jessica, you wouldn't go back to, to the traditional model now. It's such a wonderful model of actually allowing people to build a tribe around them, to build supporters and allows books to get published that simply wouldn't be published by the traditional publishers who for some reason don't see there's a market for classical music or things like that. Um, so I, I know that Jessica's worked through Unbound. I think, I'm sure we've got somebody from Unbound here. Not sure if they're here yet. Debbie, be Debbie Elliott should be here somewhere. Here yet? Can't see. Um, oh, but I yeah, I, I mean, personally, just a big shout out to Unbound because I think the more innovation we have going on in publishing and music and all the arts, the better, really. Um, so Amanda Jane says, would love to visit the various castles and locations. Where, where would you most like to go to? Um, anybody else who's read it? It made me want to go back to Vienna and just wander the streets of Vienna again. Um, um, I, I did a fair amount of that last October and um, I had the mother of all colds. It was absolutely terrible. I was trogging around all the Beethoven sites with my nose streaming. This is way before Covid was a glint in anybody's eye. But, uh, I, I, I got a, a glimpse of the, the less glamorous element of Vienna as well. Of which there is plenty in the book after all. Yeah. Um, right, so we're still having a few people coming in but I think it's slowing down. 
Um, so just a couple of other things. So if you haven't got it yet, don't worry. <laughs> we will post links to where to get it. But I think, um, so it's out paperback, it's on Kindle. And I think I'm right in saying it's the first time that one of Jessica's novels is out also as an audio book. Which there there is one other one, but it was 10 years ago. So this is this is the first since the, the whole downloading and listening on streams and such like has been possible. So right. it does represent quite a, a nice thing. Right. Yes. And out at the same time, which I think for a long time happened very late, much later in the publishing process. Um, right. I think we're fairly stable on people coming in and it's six minutes past six um i think let's let's start the party properly so it is a real joy for me to be here tonight um and i've known jessica for years but actually it was quite a long time before we met face to face in some ways this feels quite appropriate <laughs> so i was in a very early job i was assistant editor of the strad and jessica was one of our regular contributors so her name was in my paper phone book and i would phone her up fairly regularly and ask her to review cds or things and then later when i took over the magazine she would write i would commission her for longer features and of course jessica is still very much in demand music journalist but that was many years ago and since that time she fulfilled her dream since childhood of being a novelist as we said immortal is her seventh novel and it's also her longest by quite a chunk and the broadest in scope now if you've already read it you will know this isn't just a novel about a mystery in Beethoven's life. This is a picture of three generations of women living through huge societal change in Central Europe, in Vienna, in Hungary, of trauma, of Napoleonic wars. It's about a society that's run by a very small elite group of men that oppresses women, children, artists, really anybody who's not in their group and plenty of those suffering within it, just about how oppression actually affects everybody within it. Anyone with the wrong birth. And it's a terrific read, it is a real page turner. So I know Jessica's already spoken, but let's raise our virtual glasses and give a big welcome to Jessica Duchin. Thank you very much and cheers everybody. <laughs> Lovely to see so many friends and so many supporters, so many amazing musicians logging on from all over the world. We, we've got people from Spain and Switzerland and Greece and Sweden and Los Angeles and New York and it's absolutely wonderful. And as Joanna was saying, we don't really, um, we would never really have thought of this before. And there are all these amazing upsides to the fact that we can have an online book launch. So where, whatever your time zone, whether you're on morning coffee or lunchtime or cocktail hour, cheers. <laughs> now I've got a lot of very, very big thank yous to say. Um, the first of which really must be to my lovely publishers, Unbound. Um, they've pulled out all the stops to make sure that this book could still come out in the Beethoven anniversary year, despite all the problems of the pandemic. They've really thrown their weight behind it. It's been a vote of confidence um, for which I'm immensely grateful. Um, so huge, huge thanks to the unbound proprietor, John Mitchinson and his entire team. Massive thanks to Debbie Elliott, who's been in charge of the publicity. And it's lovely you could be here today with us. Um, Unbound's business model, the crowdfunding, actually updates a system of subscriptions that Beethoven himself would have recognised. And indeed, he used the system for his Opus One piano trios and remarkably, even the Mrs. Solemnus. Um, many of you here tonight have been on this long crowdfunding journey with me and have been absolutely crucial supporters of this book. And I really can't thank you enough. For me, really the most important thing besides your pledges, it's your moral support. It's the idea of building a community around the book. Uh, writing can be quite a lonely job. And um, because of that, it's very easy for a writer to sit here at the computer again, type, 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 press a button, off it goes. And then people only write to you if, to, to tell you what you've done wrong. So it's actually wonderful to feel the surge of support and excitement happening 
around the book while I'm still writing it. Um, there are three people who very, very kindly sent me quotes for the cover. Uh, they were the conductor, Marin Alsop, the violinist, Daniel Hope, and the critic, Richard Bratby. And this really meant the world to me. Um, you'll see the words on the back of the book. Um, I have to thank you a thousand times if you're out there somewhere. Now, unfortunately, lockdown has totally scuppered most of November. Um, I was planning to do some narrated concerts with a script based on the book with the amazing pianist Piers Lane. Um, I'm glad to say that the Barnes Music Society has rescheduled their one for January the 16th. So all being well, that might even go ahead. And Shiri Rashkovsky's lovely festival up close and musical at the Fidelio Orchestra Cafe in Clerkenwell has been moved to May, in which case it will be third time lucky. Uh, but thank you so much, Piers and Shuri, for bearing with me and the book. And we will get there in the end. Now, sometimes writing historical fiction can feel a little bit like disappearing down the back of a wardrobe um, into a sort of 19th century Narnia and it doesn't always endear you to your friends and family if you if someone comes and asks you a question about what do we need for, for supper and you're saying sorry I'm trapped in 1812. So I really must thank all my friends and colleagues and family and especially my husband Tom for putting up with me through all of this. Um, I'd like to thank Eric Wen in New York for talking me into writing this book in the first place because I was doing all I could to avoid it until he said I absolutely had to do it. So I thought actually he's right. Um, of course, huge, huge thanks to Joanna for agreeing to host this and being so utterly, utterly brilliant. And to Simon Hewitt Jones, our producer, who has made the whole thing possible because frankly, I haven't got a clue how these things work and he does, so he is brilliant and I can't thank him enough. Really is wonderful to have him aboard. Last but not least, I need to thank the Wigmore Hall and its director, John Gilhooley and the wonderful pianist Mishka Rushdie Moman, who joined me to uh, film a presentation on the stage of the hall at John's invitation. Mishka plays the Beethoven Piano Sonata Opus 10 number 2 in F, which was written shortly before Beethoven first met the main characters of our book. And we intersperse the movements of this uh, of this sonata with appropriate readings from the book. You can see the whole thing which is about half an hour long on the Wigmore Hall website for another couple of weeks. Um, it's on my website as well at the moment. And that was her playing that you heard on your way in, in the waiting room. And we'll be seeing an extract of the film in a little while. So I think that's probably enough of me rambling. Um, Joanna, shall, shall we go back to the book? I think we should go back to the book. Um, and I think we should hear from you too. Jessica's going to read us an extract from it. Um, and we will go straight from that into more of the Beethoven recording made at the Wigmore Hall. It will be the third movement of the Piano Sonata Opus 10 number no. 2 in F, um, taken from that Wigmore Hall recording um, with, with Mishka Rushdie moment. So Jessica, um, take us to the Hungarian countryside on a hot summer's day. Okay. So this, uh, the book is written in a series of letters to our narrator's niece. Our narrator is Teresa Brunswick von Korompa. Her sister is Josefina Brunswick von Korompa, one of her sisters, the other one is called Lottie. They have a cousin called Julia Guicciardi and a brother called Franz. And in this scene, they are at the family home in Hungary, which is a little way southwest of Budapest. So I'm going to need my glasses for this. My dear niece, it is 1801. He is in his shirt sleeves with his old new coat serving as his rug on the long grass, resting his back against my red marble monument to my father. In the shade of new leaves in the Marton Vasha Park, he is sketching a stave in his notebook, humming and sometimes singing, 
oblivious to his own volume. I stop in my tracks watching him. In my hands is a silver tray, a pottery jug of lemonade, six glasses for him, myself, Franz, Peppy, Lottie and Yulia, and a bowl of chippings from the icebox. The air is sweet. The birds are praising God and springtime. I am loath to interrupt either the creator or the creator. Peppy and Yulia walking arm in arm are some distance behind me. Yulia is 19 and gorgeous and knows it. Peppy is heavily pregnant, blooming like the earth itself. This will be her second child. Her first, named not after her own sister, but her husband's, Victoire, is in the house with mother, who is being transformed by grandmotherhood into a benevolent creature, helpless with love, singing baby songs and helping big-eyed little Vicky, 11 months old, to try rising onto her tiny feet. Beethoven's gaze lifts. Though he doesn't move, a change comes over him. I glance round and I see what he sees. Two young women in the sun, their hair and skirts dancing in the breeze, their shoulders adorned with white lace, the perfect image of joy and promise. He raises a hand to greet them, then turns straight back to his pencil and paper. He had neither seen nor heard me approaching before that. I assume he has focused so much on his inner sounds that outer ones count for nothing. I hesitate a moment longer, then go forward with the lemonade. Even Beethoven needs a cool drink in the sunshine. that we can bring Beethoven into our launch this evening. I'm going to spend a bit of time interviewing Jessica now about the book and about her writing um, and then we're going to take questions. So um, as I said just if you can hang on to your questions while I'm talking to Jessica I'm sure given the amazing people we've got here you're going to have lots of things you want to ask but if you hang on to it until afterwards it stops them getting lost. 
So the other, the other thing I didn't say, we just Jessica and I decided that we're going to try and avoid spoilers during this conversation. And again, the questions, because a lot of you haven't read it, and some of you will know some of the ideas around the central story, but we're going to try and avoid hints as far as possible. Though I apologize if you go away with slightly more clue about some of it. Um, so Jessica, this it's a novel. You say it's a novel inspired by historical events, but we all know a lot of the people in it were real. So I think we're going to start with, with pictures you found of a few of the main characters. This is actually our heroine. This is Josefina Brunswick von Korompa, um, also known as Pepi. She was a pupil of Beethoven's, and along with her sister Therese, who was our narrator in that extract, the two of them met Beethoven for the first time in 1799. And um, you can see from this picture that she's a, she's a very self-possessed, rather beautiful young woman with a lot of charm. And um, I, I don't actually know where this picture comes from. I'm still trying to find out. So if anyone can enlighten me, I would love to know. Um, she is a Hungarian countess, a talented musician, a devoted mother, intelligent, supremely sensitive, damaged by the vicissitudes of her life. And she's full of contradictions and inner conflicts. And really when you see what happens to her, it's no wonder. And she's very celebrated for her beauty, isn't she? That's one of the key drivers in the story. Um, and you can see that here you don't, <laughs> it's very much a slightly idealised portrait of a young woman. Yeah. I think a lot of portraits were very idealised at that time. Absolutely. But this feels like contrast to the next one, isn't there? I would say so. Yeah, so this is Therese, her sister. Um, and this portrait is idealized in a whole different way. This portrait was painted by Johann Baptist Egler von Lampi and was copied by Teresa herself um, in a canvas that she sent to Beethoven. And if I remember right, it's still in the Beethoven house in Bonn today, where you can see it in all its glory. Now you'll notice the ribbons in her hair. Um, this has a special significance because those ribbons designate Teresa as a Grecian priestess. Teresa, who, who was the old, eldest of the Brunswick siblings, saw herself as what she called a priestess of truth. Um, this makes her a marvellous person to have as a narrator because she's much more interested for a lot of the time in other people's lives than in her own until finally she decides to follow a very particular vocation. So it's important she that- She herself down throughout the book, doesn't she? That she's, she's not the beauty. She has, a, she has a slightly malformed spine, presumably scoliosis. Mm. Um, it's very interesting actually, because in her real memoirs, Teresa says that she had rickets as a child and that that's what made her spine misshapen. But when I looked up rickets and the symptoms and the effects of it, actually a curved spine was not one of the typical effects at all. So I suspect she actually had scoliosis. And was put down maybe to something else. Yeah, I reckon so. Mm. So what's, what's the next picture we have here? Uh -huh. oh, now this, this I love. This is a painting by Julia Schmidt, who is the artist who also did the picture that's on the front of the book. Um, now he was only born in 1854. So this is an idealized after the event image. Um, but I love this because you can almost hear the sounds coming out of the painting of this Viennese salon. That's Beethoven at the piano. His hair flying, his arms in motion, and everyone is sitting there mesmerised by his music. Unless, of course, they're actually looking down the cleavage of the lady in pink, which is also possible. Yes, and it also, see, to me, although it's a, it's a fantastic picture, it also does sum up that divide between the artists, the performing artists, performing for the, will, the wealthy, the rich. Beethoven is actually completely dependent on patronage, isn't he? Yes, he is. And he didn't want to be. He hated being dependent on princes and um, wealthy 
people who would order him around. Um, he was he fought all his life for the dignity of the artist as an independent freelancer and for the status of art as being equal to any artificially um, bestowed by birth uh, privilege that his patrons would have had. He That's really central to the novel, isn't it? That, that, that it's set in this period of tremendous turmoil of these things beginning to be talked about. The aristocracy in France are, having their, are losing their heads, literally. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't happen in Vienna, but this, the, that turmoil is very much the, the atmosphere of the story. Totally. And uh, I think we, we can't underestimate the way that um, that an age and a society impacts on an artist and their work. I don't think it's possible to divide um, music from, or indeed any art, from its times and its world and the forces that were at work on shaping the people who created it. Because if you think about it, every note of Beethoven is, um, is a choice. He has sat down at his desk and he has chosen one note rather than another, one expressive indication rather than another. He chooses to, do, instead of a nice little staccato dot, he puts these big slashes. And uh, instead, some, sometimes instead of just nice little dabs of pedal, he will indicate, you know, play this entire passage on the piano in one pedal. He, he pushes the boat out and his age was pushing the boat out as well. The, the Enlightenment was breaking apart and giving birth to romanticism. And um, of course, Napoleon um, was just breaking things apart. So it's, it's a huge part of the book. And I think one advantage of writing a novel is that you can make much more of these connections and their effects than perhaps would be obvious in, in a sort of straight academic way. At least well, I can... Well, as you were saying that, it strikes me that you've done exactly the same thing. You have chosen every word to really bring that aspect to life. I hope so. I've tried. <laughs> because it actually it shapes not just Beethoven's life, which is obviously more documented, but the life of these women caught up in that. It shapes literally every aspect of who they are, where they live, how their income comes, what, what they eat. I mean, it, I, again, I don't want to give too much away, but there's huge transformation. It's it, all the, the, the action, really, all the plot is driven in, in real life by what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. That's very, very true. So final picture. Oh, well, guess who? Guess who that is? That is the young Beethoven. Um, this portrait is by the Danish artist Christian Hornemann, and it was painted in 1803. It was actually miniature, so we, we see quite an enlarged version, well, depending on what kind of screen you're, you're watching this on. Um, Beethoven gave this miniature to his friend Stefan von Breuning as a reconciliation gesture after a fallout, which uh, we have to say Beethoven often had with even his close friends. He, was, he had a very, very hot temper. At this time, 1803, he was writing the Eroica Symphony. And it was the following year that he started paying court in earnest to the widowed Pepe. And you can, if you look at him, here you can imagine that actually here is not that uh, grunged old misery guts that later uh, ages liked to portray Beethoven as. This is someone who has a lot of attitude, knows his own worth, knows his genius, knows also that he has a big problem in the sense that he is losing his hearing. But you, you can see he's almost thinking, I am going to seize fate by the throat and he's probably hoping to seize Pepe by something else altogether. Um, but he's, not, you know, he's an attractive, appealing, fascinating young man. And I believe he really rather liked this image of himself too. For me, this is the young man who, I'm fairly early on in the book, he and Pepe are out, almost sort of dancing in the streets of, of Vienna. They're sort of out there, one evening they're, they're out for ice cream. 
and dancing in the fountains. Yeah. And that's it's become possible rather than the grumpy old man with, with the ear trumpet. Yeah. And actually, if you, if you think about it, I mean, he, he wasn't that old. We, I keep reading things about as a Beethoven, or, you know, the ageing Beethoven said this, that and the other, but he was 56 when he died. And um, 56 today really doesn't feel anything other than, you know, decent, respectable middle age. Mm, which brings down the tragedy of it, really, of the, all the circumstances that led to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an interesting point about bringing together that reality. I mean, your first book, you know all about facts and research. Your first published books, as we haven't mentioned, were biographies. You wrote a biography of Foray and one of Corngold. And then you moved into fiction, um, where I think it's a five fiction novels. Um, before, and two out of your last three have been historical fiction. Is that finally went right? This is finally how I can bring together all those bits. Um, sort of. I mean, I, I sort of have, in a way, I, I don't want to say I have a personal brand because I think it sounds very pretentious, but I, I do in that I write about music and that's kind of what I do, whether it is writing opera librettos or journalism or plays or fiction or biographies um it, it all comes down to music and words about music um but i i think that that there's a particular rewardingness that i found in writing historical fiction which has probably been the most satisfying of the books so far because it's it's a wonderful chance for yeah I just I enjoy it more I love this business of going down the back of the of the wardrobe and finding myself in another world and just trying to find new ways of looking at things I think in the music field there are so many instances of kind of received opinions and things that we somehow have been inculcated to know about a composer um which actually that there may be other ways of looking at it because the way we look at Beethoven is also shaped by our age and our preoccupations. And in a way, this is why the identity of the immortal beloved, which is at the heart of this novel, has proved so interesting and so contentious because it's not the contention is not necessarily about them, it's about us and how we presented and how we research it and who we believe when they have researched it and that frankly needs a book all to itself. Uh, but writing historical fiction also it has a different set of responsibilities doesn't it and I'm thinking about the way we see Richard the third is shaped by the way Shakespeare portrayed him and it's what Peter Schaffer did in Amadeus. Now it's quite difficult to separate out Amade um, Mozart, particularly unless we've, we're sort of scholars on it, from the sort of the, the foul mouthed boy child. And of course fiction will tend to meet, to reach a lot more people than formal biography. So actually you're shaping a, a, a perception actually far more strongly. Does that, is that a, a weight of responsibility or? Um, it, is, it is a responsibility that I am seeking actively, I would say, because I feel that um, it, when I meet people at um, other people's parties and such like, and they say, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a music journalist and I write books about music. And they get, oh, well, I don't know very much about classical music. And they sort of, you know, sort of make for the door. And these are usually educated, intelligent, professional people who somehow have been de-skilled in the area of music by British culture in the last 30 years or so, which I find incredibly sad. Um, and if you go into a bookshop or a library and you look at the biography section, you will see biographies of novelists and architects and artists and scientists and doctors and all the people who shape our society up there, biography. And then you think, where's music? And classical music is sort of squirreled away in a, in a little corner, sort of under the counter, so it's something slightly guilty and all the stuff. I want music to go mainstream because that's where it belongs because this, as I think a lot of people will have felt during lockdown and during a time in which we have been deprived of the live arts that we take for granted so terribly and so much, um, 
everyone suddenly thought, oh my God, where are the concerts? Where's the theater? What's going on? Can we live without music? No, we flipping well can't live without music. And I'm hoping that this, these novels will help the music to get out there and to reach people who will be fascinated and drawn in and discover something that will transform their lives potentially. I mean, the trouble is they are missing out. We're not normally out to say they're missing out. We're too busy apologizing. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm into classical music. Now, come on, listen to Beethoven. He will make it, he will transform your view of the world. So yes, it's a responsibility, <laughs> that's what I want to do. <laughs> and for the music itself, but also for the characters. I mean, this is a fantastic story in its own right. And if it was any other art form, as you say, maybe the wood, it would be taken up more. But I mean, I suppose Beethoven is already an outlier in the, the, the sort of the, the knowledge of him. Um, when you're writing about these characters, well, particularly in this book, does it feel, how different is it to writing about purely fictional characters? How far do they have a life of their own and how far do you control them? Um, I think the important thing to remember here is that truth is always stranger than fiction. I mean, there's stuff in this book you just couldn't make it up. You really couldn't. And um, I, I found that also with um, with my last musical historical novel, which was Ghost Variations, which was a little more recent, that was set in the 30s. That was full of the weirdest, weirdest stories and the most astonishing characters who I feel I could never have invented in a month of Sundays. Um, I, I have some nice characters in my other novels, but nothing like the real Yeli Darani, that's a great violinist who was my heroine for that book. And I certainly couldn't have invented a Beethoven. I mean, he, is, he is remarkable and getting to know him and getting behind the myths that made the, the man into a de the demigod that we see him as now has, has really transformed my view of his music as well. Well, I wanted to ask you that. How has it changed? How has it changed that relationship? Um, it's it's made it even more astonishing than it already was. I mean, there are. I I grew up listening to Beethoven. I've taken Beethoven for granted all my life. Some of my earliest memories are of listening to the Pastoral Symphony at home with with my parents, and hearing my brother practicing violin sonatas. He he was a very good violinist, although he's become a scientist in the end. Um, he's, Beethoven's always been there, but then to get inside the skin and see what he had to endure and see how he dealt with it and how he, he would, he went through some terrible lows. He, he went through suicidal patches and he would hit rock bottom and he'd bounce up again. And he would bounce up by pushing his art even further. So every time you you see this change in Beethoven, he's had some sort of crisis and he's going, no, I can get out of this by writing the Eroica Symphony or by writing the Hammerklavier. I mean, to me, the greatest piano piece ever written. I mean, it's a piano sonata, isn't it? That really run like the sort of the, the pearls through this story that reflect and amplify the moments. And I know for me, I mean, last at the weekend after I finished it, I just wanted to get down my copy of, of piano sonatas and play through Travesa's sonata. I mean, you know, obviously I'm <laughs> the piano sonata, nowhere near it, but it made me, it drove me to that. In terms of the, the piano sonatas in particular, did you find yourself spending a lot of time with them? Uh, yes. Absolutely. But there, there's actually a, a good uh, real historical reason for this, which is this is how most people in his time would have got to know Beethoven, because really an orchestral performance was was not a commonplace event. There would be small private performances in, in the palaces of some of the princes, perhaps, and an occasional concert that Beethoven would put on a so-called academy concert in perhaps the University Hall of Vienna, which is covered in these kind of wild murals. It's an astonishing place. Or he would have a benefit concert in the Burgtheater, which would raise a bit of money for him. You couldn't be sure what the standard was going to be like. It might be the only time in your life you would ever hear his Seventh Symphony played by 
And as we were saying, the, the changes going on at that time, it's very difficult to put on performances when you've got armies marching around and, oh, <laughs> and your so currency is plunging and everything else. But you can go home and you can play the piano. Yes. yes. And Which that's exactly that's, how you, that's how you learn the music is by playing it yourself. So I've spent a lot of time playing Beethoven during lockdown. I've learned some of the sonatas that I've never learned before. I've learned one that I think he wrote for Pepe, which is full of the, the most wonderfully sort of teasing, affectionate, joyous music. And I've been practicing the Waldstein Sonata, which I love to pieces. And it's like, it's like Pilates for the soul. It's incredibly demanding, but the more you put into it, the more you get out of it and you come out feeling like you've been for a run around the park. It's, it's that strong and that energizing. And I know of no other composer who gives back so much. There's so much more I can ask you, but I have promised to throw this open and um, give the chance to, to ask questions more generally. So a couple of ways, um, there's a chat box, which some of you have already been using. So if you've got a question for Jessica, do type it into there, um, or, um, you can come on screen and ask them personally. There's two ways, the best way of doing that is at the bottom of your screen, you'll probably find a thing that says participants. If you click on that, you'll find a list of names and a next to your name, there'll be a thing that says raise hand. And if you do that, then I can, I can see that you have done that um, and can come on calling you. You could also wave to me, but I'm not, I may miss that because there's too, too many of you to be able to see everybody's on screen. Um, so I've got a first question. Um, this is a really nice one. So, so Claire Stevens, thank you Claire, says, I'm interested in the nicknames or abbreviations your characters use to refer to one another. Um, so Peppy and Tizzy and, uh, do you have sources for these? Do you think it was how Josefina and her family really referred to one another? Um, there, there are sources actually, because Therese handily actually wrote real memoirs. Um, there's a slight problem, which is that they're in Hungarian and um, they are very, very hard to get hold of. Um, fortunately, in the 1920s, um, a music journalist called Ida Maria Lipsius, known generally as La Mara, published a book about Beethoven and the Brunswicks in which she included quite a large chunk of, of this. And a lot of other academics have been through the existing material and sort of sifted things out. And Josephine really was called Peppy for short. Um, I think Therese was known as Tezzy. Um, you, you can see the effect of all these nicknames when you get to the character of Julia Guicciardi, their cousin, because Julia Guicciardi is actually the dedicatee of the Moonlight Sonata and was thought for a very long time to be the immortal beloved herself. And she and Beethoven certainly flirted and he called her Giulietta and she called him Luigi. So the Moonlight Sonata is dedicated to Giulietta Guicciardi from Luigi. And this was incredibly helpful to me because the one thing I could not do while I was writing the book is keep talking about Ludwig. I just could not call him Ludwig. It's, it's like this figure, Ludwig. Um, it's impossible. So to me, Beethoven became Luigi and then he became manageable. So it's a very pertinent question. Thanks, Claire. Um, another question. Um, what, what was the, the best part of writing Immortal and what was the worst part? I love those dualities. Uh, the best part was doing it at all. Um, the, the, my favourite thing really is writing the first draft where you, you have to just go for it. And um, you, you have to, you, you'd be reading and reading and reading and reading and reading and walking around Vienna till your feet nearly fall off. But at some point you have to sit down and write and you need to have that, that sense of momentum and that sense of pace and flight and, fantasy that um, you can only really capture in the first draft. You know, after that, it's a question of refining it all. Um, My sense when we were writing it, sorry, before we answer the second bit, is that actually, the, I think we were in lockdown by then, we were not coming into it, it actually went fairly fast compared to some of your novels. Is that true? 
Yeah, very much so, because I had the anniversary breathing down my neck. And um, at the very beginning, which was early last year, um, after I'd had that chat with my friend from New York, who I, I told him the story and he nearly fell off his chair. And he said, why aren't you turning this into a novel? And I said, oh, it's too big. And he said, you've got to do it. You've absolutely got to do it. And um, I thought, oh, help. And he said, come on, it's the anniversary next year. It's now or never. And I thought, shit, he's right. Um, so uh, I did, I, I, I sat down with the person who was then my editor at Unbound and said, look, I have this amazing idea. And would it, firstly, would it be possible to do it? Secondly, would it, what time frame do I need? When would I need to get it to you? If it was going to happen in time for the anniversary. So he told me, and that gave me basically um, about uh, 15 months or so to do it. So I thought, right, well, let's see. And it's it's wonderful to have a challenge like that, that mm. where you're sort of racing against the clock, just to just to prove to yourself you actually can do it. So yeah, that was worth it. What was, the, what was the worst part or the worst moment? Oh, there were so many of them. I, the, the sleepless nights I've had over this book, you would not believe. I mean, waking up at two in the morning with the, everything going around around, panicking. So have I left this out? Or when I said such and such, is that true? And I need to check, have I actually checked X, Y, or Z? And then I, I had this amazing night when I had I was about to send back the last set of proofs and I couldn't sleep and I was still trying to find one of the locations um, which is a chateau in the Czech countryside somewhere and I couldn't find it and couldn't find it and couldn't find it and it's not that important but I did want to know where it was and um I just, because I couldn't sleep, I switched on my iPad and I started Googling with slightly different terms for this thing that I'd used before. I just approached, I came to it from a different direction. And I found the chateau at four o'clock in the morning when I had to send the proofs back at 10 o'clock. And guess what? It is now a luxury spa hotel and I could have gone and stayed there. It looks absolutely wonderful. <laughs> So I missed my chance. Is that next year's travel plans when all this is over? <laughs> when all this is over, I'm going to South Bohemia where there are more chateaus per square inch than chocolate shops in Bruges. <laughs> Great plans. So Tasman says, I remember when you started this project and you told me that you had to write a certain number, amount of words per day. Did you stick to that? <laughs> Or did you end up simply writing, writing and writing? And how does it feel now? Um, I just wrote and wrote and wrote because of course I'm, I'm always firefighting. I'm having to alternate my creative work with my bread and butter work. Um, so I just, I just went for it. And um, I don't really know how it got there. It just sort of did. Um, and now I, I miss it. I wish I was still writing it. I still wake up in the morning sort of with, with the characters going buzz, buzz, buzz in my head and wanting to get back and write about them. And I, and I can't because the book's here. So there you go. All my heads instead. <laughs> um, Peter Thompson says, despite the deadline, you must have had to do a fantastic amount of research. I mean, the, the research in this book is extraordinary. How did you divide your time between research and writing? Well, I'd done most of the research before I ever decided to write the book. Um, I had been, I started reading about this about seven years ago when I was asked to do a, um, a talk in a string quartet festival about Beethoven and women. And I started reading and I discovered this whole um, crazy thing going on around the identity of the immortal beloved and I got hooked and I just read everything I could get my hands on and I was I love ordering in really obscure stuff from abooks.com I spent most of my disposable income on secondhand books you can probably tell from my shelves back there and um, I've got some very obscure stuff some of which has been hideously badly translated but has some really important information in it 
And then I was tracking down articles in musicological journals. And I spent hours and hours and hours on the website of the Beethoven House Museum in Bonn, which has the most incredible collection and luckily has digitized a lot of it. So you can access the material without actually having to, to go and rifle through catalogues in Bonn itself. So I, I had to keep checking a lot of stuff as I went along, but uh, fortunately it's all there to be checked because there are so many books about Beethoven. There are so many books. And related to that, Pierce, and I'm going to slightly paraphrase just so we avoid the obvious spoiler. Um, in terms of the identity of the immortal beloved, how convinced are you that um, you personally, that the story in, the, in here is the right identity? I am totally convinced. And um, it was very nice for me when um, it turned out, when, when I talked to the head of the Beethoven house, that they are 90% sure that this is the right one. Right. It's been overshadowed for a long time, but it does seem that it's, it's very, very likely to be true. So Robert Katz is saying, very interesting question related to that. How did you decide that Therese was going to narrate this book? Um, I have... In the context of that is, so in the book, so Josephine is probably a sort of closer relationship to Beethoven. So why was it Therese who was... Um, I've always enjoyed these books where there's an observer. And um, I, th I think that the first novel I ever tried to write was actually quite quite similar it was uh, it was someone's best friend observing a relationship developing and I like this feeling that you, here is someone who is slightly outside but can see perhaps a little more clearly than the people who are in the middle of things she can stand back and she can watch them making their mistakes or uh, not making their mistakes or uh, indeed being part of it and not necessarily having a good effect all the time, not necessarily knowing what her own effect is going to be on the way that, that their story is developing. And also I find Teresa a fascinating character in her own right. I mean, she is so ahead of her time. She's a pioneering feminist. She is a pioneering educationalist in particular. She actually founded the system of kindergartens um, in Hungary and in Bavaria as well. It was, a, a lot of that was, was her doing. And for someone today, I think it's probably much easier to relate to a female character who who is strong and pioneering and independent rather than someone who is being buffeted around by fate to the degree that Josefina was. I felt Theresa actually that if you'd created her now you'd be accused of, of creating somebody who was more acceptable to modern tastes which probably shows the, the view that we have of women at that time but there were I mean she was probably an outlier and fairly exceptional but she is remarkable isn't she she really is. She really is, and she, you know, it's this. This is real in a way. If anything, I've toned her down a bit because some of the articles say that God, this woman was really over the top, and um, I have toned down her religious side a little because it it could be quite overwhelming, the 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 element that religion played in her life, and um, you know, it is a modern novel. I do want people to be able to relate to these characters. And, um, it, you know, it's, uh, I've been true to her, but I also want us to be able to see ourselves in this world and these people. And she was a route to being able to do that. It sounds as though the whole process was actually quite a flowing one once you got going. And Harriet Mackenzie says, did you have moments when it was right at lock or time? You sort of, was it a struggle? You've already talked about the struggle of getting in the fact checking things, but did, did, was writer's block a thing at any point? I didn't have time to have writer's block. <laughs> it's about having a deadline. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, the, the difficult thing was actually getting going in the first place and thinking, God, this is going to be, you know, I mapped out the story, I thought, God, this is going to be massive. And I knew it was going to be a tough, a tough call. But yeah, once I actually started, it just went.
So thank you for your comments. I think I've got most of the questions. Um, Catherine Butler says, Beethoven manuscript exhibition in the Austrian National Library is fascinating. Um, so what, in February, maybe any of this year. Have you seen it, Jessica? I did not get to Vienna this year. I went uh, last yeah. autumn, by which time it hadn't yet begun. And I thought, well, I'll go back in the spring. And then... Bang. <laughs> so and no. Fascinating insight from the restrictions of any society and the vulnerability of women to, to, to manipulative men. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, it is five to seven, and we said that we would be over by seven o'clock. So the, the downside of not having a real life launch is that we can't all go to the pub and just carry on chatting, because I think that that would be the, the obvious thing that we would love to do now. So much we'd love to talk about. Um, so sadly moving to wrap up now but just a reminder of a few things if you haven't got the book well you know this is the perfect christmas present for all the music and literature lovers in your life um wanted to highlight a new website called bookshop.org.uk simon has put it up in the chat box there with the link um sorry uk and that's that's the link to immortal um and they pay a proper margin to lo your local bookshop um and it was a pickaxe unlike other booksellers are available, I could venture on things. Um, however, if you have bought through Amazon or use Goodreads, then it's always really helpful to read a review, to leave a review. Um, those things make a huge difference or rating to the, to the success of the book. And hopefully when all this is over, there will be a new series of Jessica's Conscience that she's talked about, the Supper Club, which I absolutely want to come to. Um, and I know that the chef there is excellent. Um, the concerts are fabulous. They add a whole new dimension to, to the books. So really worth looking out for. And if you want to stay in touch with what's going on, the best way to do that is on Jessica's, well, the, the Immortal Facebook page. And on Jessica's own website, you will find the link to the Wig Wigmore video and, um, and bookshelf and, sorry, bookshop and the other things and, and what's on. So for me, a huge thank you to everybody involved in this. Um, for to Jessica, to Mishka, to Simon. Um, Jessica, I know you want to say a few words before we finally depart. Um, yes, I, I can't thank everyone enough for coming along today. It's it really has felt like a real party, and um, it's taken me by surprise how real it is because I'm here in my study. Um, but Joanna and Simon and I were chatting earlier and saying, actually, this is it's every bit as as complex and exciting and you know, thrilling to to a large degree as putting on an event in in a, a proper venue. And it's only a shame that we, we can't all actually be together and um, I, I can't just treat you all to champagne, which I would very much like to do and which I hope when all of this is over we will be able to do again but again the upside is that we have people from all over the world with us today and it is wonderful to see you even at a very great distance so thank you thank you thank you thank you for me for coming and your energy and questions and huge congratulations to jessica a final round of applause for jessica and immortal thank you